In the midst of the pandemic, I trained for an entire year. And then I flew to Africa to climb the single tallest peak in the world, Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> but it was one of the hardest things I have ever done. <laughs> it took me and us eight days. We went through the rainforest, the desert, and the Arctic zone. My friend, when she found out I was going, she was like, don't do it, Alicia. It's called Kill a Man, Jaro. <laughs> <laughs> but I went anyway. <laughs> Here's my team, and it took me 20 hours to get to the summit. Once I got there, I only had a few minutes to take a few pictures and get back down the mountain. That's it. <laughs> and when you're going up a mountain, you have to acclimatize to the oxygen. So you're going like this, right? But when you get to the top, you gotta get down, it's a steep decline. So I'm there, I'm looking out, and I'm like, oh my goodness, how in the world am I gonna make it down this mountain? Because all I saw was rocks and broken gravel. Every step I took, was shaky. <clears throat> I fell, not once, not twice. And when I fell, I fell backwards on my knee like five times. I was hurt and I was getting scared because at this point it was just me and my porter. They did not tell us that we were gonna have to be without, uh, we were gonna be with limited food. They did not tell us to preserve our water supply. They spent so much time preparing us to get to the summit that they failed to prepare us to come down. Not cool. <laughs> they said it was gonna take two hours to get to base camp. Lies. <laughs> two hours turned to four hours. Four hours turned to eight hours. I tried to remain positive. I kept my head down, I put my headlamp on, I put one step in front of the other. But I was cold, I was injured, I was isolated, and I was without the rest of my team. And you know, it's like that in school sometimes. We're isolated, stressed out, and a lot is going on. In this past school year, my principal retired. We didn't have enough uh, students for two assistant principals, so one was transferred. Soon after, the other one was transferred. Our technology facilitator left the school system altogether. Our dean was promoted and two of my coworkers left. I was feeling pretty alone. And we, we know that when you're alone, you miss out on meaningful relationships. And I knew I was gonna have to figure out a way to rebuild my team. And there are three critical team players that I had to get in touch with. Now, did I tell you there's no time to build a team? Because as soon as we step on campus, we got cafeteria duty, <laughs> lunch duty, after school bus duty, we gotta walk them to the bathroom, we gotta walk them to the cafeteria, we got lesson plans, we got staff meetings. When? When are we gonna find time? But you know, it was one morning during cafeteria duty that I met Nicole. Meet Nicole. Nicole is an EC teacher. That stands for Exceptional Children. Yep, give it up, give it up, give it up. <laughs> Nicole says her children are extraordinary, and that's a good thing. 
So we began to talk, and she also told me that her department is often overlooked and left out. So I said, okay. I came up with a little plan, I pitched it to her, and she, she liked it. So I wrote a grant, I got it, and now we're gonna be collaborating, and I get to work with my ace, right? We're gonna be collaborating on Fridays, her math class, and my robotics club. So I'm super excited about that. Now listen, Nicole sees me. There would be times when I would come into the cafeteria looking crazy and she'd be like, girl, you okay? <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> she gave me so many good teaching tips, like letting my students lead. Nicole is on my team, and I am so grateful that she is one of my colleagues at JMA. <laughs> Now, let me tell you the next critical partner you need on your team. These individuals know your students better than you do, and they love them. <laughs> I'm talking about their parents, <laughs> okay? I got to know one parent really well, and let's just call her Brian's mom, okay? So, let me roll back. We were at the beginning of the school year, and I was, had all my classroom expectations and all my rules set, all my systems in place. We have low staff, so our classes are combined. I have a class of 45 students. Brian is in my class of 45 students, okay? So, I'm going over the classroom culture, setting my expectations talking about how I was gonna treat them, how they gonna treat me, when all of a sudden, out of the blue, boom, a wad of masking tape hits my clipboard. Now, I, done ju I just went over the classroom rules. <laughs> so I, I'm pissed at this point. <laughs> I'm like, how, what is happening? So this, look, I, I'm sending my first note home to Brian's mom. And that, there it started, back and forth, emails, parent conferences. Every week, it was something different. I was getting frustrated. His parents were getting frustrated. He was frustrated. And you know, sometimes, as teachers, we have the option to transfer students out of our class. And that's what I should have did. <laughs> like, get your butt on out of here. <laughs> But I didn't, I didn't. I was like, let me, let me go towards the problem instead of running away from it. So I decided to invite them to the class, okay? His mom showed up and I tell you, it was one of the best decisions ever because when she came into the classroom, she better understood what I was going through as a classroom teacher and my frustration and I better understood her need to advocate for her son. It was a win-win situation. Now, I'm not saying this is gonna always be the case, <laughs> okay? But it worked out in this situation. And sometimes when I'm in my classroom during fourth block, when those eighth graders are coming through, Brian will come up to my door and try to get in the door. I'm like, boy, what are you doing? He's like, Miss Smalls, you know this is my favorite class. I'm like, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but what I do know is that Brian is such an intelligent young man and he has a bright future ahead of him and it took all of us to make him successful. Yep, all of us. <clears throat> and now I'm gonna tell you about another, the last component that needs to be on your team. And that is the community. So last year, I got my evaluation back and I got some suggestions. Alicia, you need to get out in the community. And I'm like, okay. So I had Miss Monica, our career and technical education director, 
She reached out to me because I told her I was interested in doing more things. And she said, Alicia, we have an opportunity for you to be a first tech challenge robotics coach. I said, okay, sign me up. <laughs> I had no idea <laughs> of how hard it was going to be. How many of you know you cannot code scrap metal and screws? <laughs> it just doesn't work. <laughs> I had to design, build, code, and drive a robot before my students did. It was stressful. <laughs> it was stressful. And when I got my team, they were stressed. And I thought I was failing. <laughs> You know, I was like, this is so hard. But then, as I got a little further into it, I realized that FIRST has something that is called gracious professionalism. This saved me. Because gracious professionalism says that even though we are in competition, I'm gonna help you be your absolute best. And that is exactly what they did. That looks like Robert from Pyro Eagle's team driving all the way from Shelby, North Carolina to Charlotte to give us some extra batteries for our robot. That looks like Jade, our president, getting on social media saying we need help with our scoring mechanism and having Kate from UNCC come over and spend three afternoons helping us get our coding, our, uh, our mechanism working correctly and connecting our bot. The FTC community was amazing. They helped us expand our reach. And as a result, our team, the Axolotls 21401, won the judges award. <laughs> And we made it to the semifinals twice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, now, let's get back to this mountain, okay? Remember, I had my head down, I was trying to focus to just get down this mountain because every step was shaky and I was already hurt and I was tired. And we were going along, and all of a sudden, this other group of porters comes alongside of us. And there's this guy in there, this other porter, and he says, I'm in charge. And I'm looking like, I don't know you. Like Kiki Palmer says, I don't know this man. <laughs> I didn't trust him. I was hesitant. I was reluctant. But we made it down the mountain. We made it down the mountain. So as I was reminiscing, right? You reminisce, looking through my pictures. I saw my great, beautiful daughters who went to meet with me to Zanzibar and supported me throughout the entire journey. And then I looked and saw my friends who, who trained with me all year long. And then I looked at our group picture. There's me in the middle right there. And then, y'all see the guy in the blue and white puffy jacket back there? Right there? That is the porter that I said I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> he was a part of my team the entire time! <laughs> but because I had my head down, I was stressed out, isolated, feeling alone. I wasn't processing correctly. I wasn't thinking correctly, right? I was processing through a fog. And that happens sometimes in the classroom, right? What we think is a problem may not necessarily be a problem, right? So my takeaway is this. Know who's on your team. You better figure out who your people are, okay? My colleagues have been amazing at JMA, okay? The parents, you've got to get to know your parents. They're going to help you carry the weight, okay? And you've got to reach out to the community because they are going to help you expand your reach. 
Know who your people are, because what you have may not be enough, okay? When you know who your people are, they are going to help you move, climb, and maneuver some of the biggest mountains in your teaching career. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.